All right, so this is my review of the Canyon Commuter 7. I've had this for a couple months now, so if you haven't seen it already, I did an initial impressions video, but this is going to be a little more, this is going to be a little more focused a video, and just to be a quick review for those who are interested in this model, or any of the models in the Canyon uh, Commuter lineup. Um, note this is not the commuter on, which is the e-bike, because this is entirely a manual bike. Um, those are different bikes with different handling characteristics. So, look at a different review for those. Alright, so, firstly, two months, I have done essentially no servicing other than putting air in the tyres. I haven't cleaned it, I've been riding in good conditions like this, I've also been riding in wet, heavy rain. Uh, but I haven't really done much in the way of mud or that kind of riding. Um, I ride on the road, turn from my office, tend not to have so much mud. Thank you, plane. I really needed an extra background. Alright, so let's recap on the basic features of this bike. So, first thing you notice is we have a belt drive here. So, the Kenyan Commuter lineup all comes with the Gates Carbon Bike belt drive. And if you're not familiar with this, it's basically what the name suggests, a big, almost like rubber belt that goes between the front chain ring and the rear sprocket of your bike. Now, the major win of this is you don't have to worry about cleaning, oiling, degreasing a chain, but I can also do this. I'm touching the belt that I've been riding for two months, and my hand is clean. There's no build-up of grease and grit in the way that occurs on a chain. And so the idea is, other than just washing it off and making sure it's like, free of large particles of mud you don't have to do anything with this and so I normally get about 10,000 K out of a chain I'm hoping I get 30,000 out of the belt which is what we need to believe um, unfortunately I can't tell you the answer for that until we've done many many more years of riding on it but so far it is holding up which is great the other thing about it is it is completely silent um, there is no noise from from this assembly as it spins uh, and it's kind of weird the first time you ride the bike because you're on this bike, you're speeding along and there's just no noise and important to know, there's no noise from either the front or the rear hub and in some ways it's a bit of a problem with commuters because when you're riding through groups of people they don't hear the bike coming and so I guess you can resort to the bell but it's really your only option other than being one of those annoying people who yells out um, which I don't particularly like doing so yeah, it is completely silent, um, and that's because the front's on the dynamo for the lights, and then the rear has the Alfine 11 speed hub, to the get hub. Now, note that the entry level models, the 5 and the 6, come with a Nexus hub, and then the 7 onwards come with the Alfine 11. Um, the Nexus is also a really good hub, if you were buying it for a hilly environment, I would go with the Alfine, because on the Alfine, I feel that this bike still doesn't quite have a low enough gearing relationship or arrangement for the typical 10% type gradient hills that I have to ride. Um, a Nexus with an 8 speed gear is probably a bit worse on that front, and so if you're a hilly environment, I would go the 11. But if I'm in a flattish city and I want to save a bit of money, I'm sure the 8 is also a great unit. Um, important to note too that all of their lineup is cable pulled. Uh, cable cord hubs and the big difference on the six, 5 and 6 versus the 7 onwards is the 7, 8 and 9 have the traditional push shifters whilst the six, 5 and 6 have a twist shift. Now that's a matter of personal preference, I ride a lot of bikes, mountain bike, road bike, so I'm really into my trigger shifters, I like the sportiness of them. Uh, the grip shifters always remind me of like city bikes or rentals, bikes from different countries but Hey, each your own. If it's a big problem for you, you can get aftermarket trigger shifters from, I think it's MicroShift, um, which will work with the 5 and the 6. So you're not locked into it if you did want to change. So one of the challenges of Alfine is when you want to drop gears, you can't drop smoothly while it's under torque. So you need to give it a speed. And then you can drop multiples at once, but you can't drop whilst climbing. It's a little different to a normal bike. The upside is I can do this. I'm now descending 
too loose. I just change through six odd gears at once. One problem I've got with it is I could do with a lower gear ratio for the hills around here. Um, so I'm in Wellington, and basically everything's hilly. Um, it would be beneficial to have one lower gear. And really, what I would like would be for Kenyon to ship this with an option of maybe a 46 or a 42 front ring um, to increase the ratio that I have for hill climbing. At the trade-off of downhill and flat speed but I mean this bike I've rocketed along at 50k an hour along the down down a, down a small slope with the ratio on the back it's really good for high speed I can live if it was 40 if it meant easier climbing and the real reason I care about climbing is I kind of got this bike because I wanted to get fitter and so I'm happy grinding my way up a hill after work but it does limit the cargo ability because if you've put 15 kilos of weight on the back of it you can't drop to an easier gear to make that hill climb more tolerable. If you're already grinding at the start with no cargo, it's going to be even more unpleasant. And so you can't really just spin your spin to win on the way up the hill, which is a bit is a bit rough. And the other caveat I'll call out uh, is if you need to remove the back wheel, you do need a spanner. Um, and so I will ride with a little tiniest little spanner. Um, to, so I'm do that and a little bit of extra faffery of removing the. Uh, gear shift cable and popping up the rear wheel. Um, the rims and tyres are supposedly tubeless ready and it is actually a consideration I may switch it out to tubeless just because I don't want to be messing around on the side of the road changing out tyres on this bike. Um, pretty standard effectively for a modern bike, it's got uh, front and rear hydraulic disc brakes, um, you know just basic Shimano hydraulics, work a treat, I honestly have never had any complaints with any Shimano hydraulic disc brakes on any of my bikes. They're just an exceptionally reliable setup. Um, and front and rear, um, both from hydraulics, you've got great stopping power. Um, I bombed down a hill, I'm up about 120 meters elevation at the moment. I bombed down to the every morning, about 50k an hour, and I have no concern braking and stopping on this particular bike. Oh, this is very good. No stopping issues whatsoever. Um, cargo rack takes 15 up to 15 kilos. You'll note these knobs on the side which are welded in. These are to fit Ortlieb QL3 and so you can click on the Ortlieb bag if you have it. So you do one on each side. The one thing I'll note is that 15 kilos is not a massively heavy weight rack. So you're not going to be able to put like a child seat on the rear or anything like that. And for those who are wondering about aftermarket rack options, there is a mounting point just here. But other than the fender mounting point, there's nothing else to attach your own racks. Um, as much as I hate to say it, if you are wanting to do more than 15 kilos of cargo on this bike, it's probably unfortunately the wrong setup. Um, you would need, or you'd probably want, a frame that's better designed for a large amount of weight on the rear. So that's a big one. It's also not a very wide rack, and so once you can put two bags on it, if you're trying to like balance a box of beer it can be a bit tricky in fact I had this problem the other day where I had to put of all things a big uh, pile of toilet paper because there's not many spots to latch down yeah because there's no piece of here you can't just hold stuff on the side of the bike you're pretty much limited to try to strap it down on the top which is not ideal and certainly this doesn't feel particularly good right so if your model of commuting is two clip on bags this will work amazingly if your model commuting is piling all kinds of weird junk on the back of your rack, uh, which is something I certainly did with my e-bike, where the rack is very sturdy in a rate of 25 kilos, um, with a lot of side braces. Again, this is weight trade-off, right? Like you can't have a super sturdy rack and a super light bike. I mean, this bike's already 12 kilos, which is getting up there. Um, in terms of the fenders, happy with these. Aluminium fenders, they've done well. I've ridden it in torrential rain and well, so you get soaked from the rain but at least protects from the splash up um, really good no issues at all um, the integrated lights front and rear using the dynamo these are really good i've never used dynamo lights before but um, i'll probably describe it as it's another just having a hardwired e-bike 
when I run my bike, the light's automatically on. Same thing is true here. They shine a good amount of light. Um, I do ride on with secondaries. I actually have uh, mount points for some cyclic cycling dash cameras that also double as lights. And so when I'm riding, I tend to use these guys on solid. And then I have my dash cam acting as a blinking light just for a bit of extra visibility and awareness for people. Uh, but I've had no reason to doubt the lights on this. For around town riding, if the integrated lights are probably more than good enough. Um, I would only consider secondary lights if I was riding in unlit non-urban areas like a unlit highway or back roads um, that had insufficient lighting. But if you're around town, uh, the built-in lights should be more than enough for most people. Um, seat and feet post is a static post. I'm perfectly happy for feet. Um, some people might find it a little uncomfortable. It's not like the world's most comfy seat. I'll describe it as being like the seat you get on a cheap mountain bike. Yeah, you don't need a chamois to ride it, but if you did 100k on it, you might feel a bit sore. Uh, but you know what? Easy thing in the world to change and a very personal preference. So I'm quite happy with the basic one, but if you weren't, it's not a big deal to change it. Um, pedals, I did change out. Um, I've got some AliExpress specials of all things, but they're um, nice uh, multi bearing pedals um, made of aluminium. Um, comes with some basic ones with default, don't rate them, but you know, basic basic pedal does what it needs to initially. And I also changed out the reflectors because I thought the ones that it came with were hideously ugly. So I bought some smaller reflectors. Um, as I mentioned in my previous video, I really think they should have shipped with a tyre that had a reflective rim. I feel for an urban bike that we really have elevated um, the visibility and the safety of it in a uh, heavy traffic environment. But this is what it is. When I do wear through tyres, I'll certainly consider getting some with a side reflective sidewall. Um, speaking of the tyres, really happy with these. These are a all-round gravel tyre. I think it's a 40 mil gravel tyre. Um, 38 mil gravel tyre, sorry. And yeah, really, really good. Um, good grip around town. Smooth rolling. I've had really good experiences riding over big potholes, um, chip feel, tarmac. Uh, I think it's a pretty good choice minus that reflectiveness uh, for around town. I will probably go, well, I was thinking of going fully slick eventually, but that being said, this is basically a small little gravel bike, and I'll honestly consider riding this a lot more on rail trails, because I often feel overbiked riding my massive mountain bike with um, chum chunky Max SDHF tyres, this is completely overkill for a rail trail. This actually do it pretty well, and the integrated lights are always handy when you forget to bring yours and you're riding for a tunnel. So, I may put new gravel tyres back on it in the future, but yeah, the option is this. Um, grips, Ergon grips. I haven't really been with these type of grips much. I don't know if I love them still. Um, I kind of prefer just a straight round grip, but again, very much a personal preference, and you can happily change these out. Uh, they are kind of nice for like, the ability to rest your hand a bit, but I don't know if it annoys me more than it benefits me. Uh, again though, very very much personal preference. Um, in terms of position and geometry, I'm really happy with it. Um, I'm 182 centimetres, and so I've got the large uh, model. Um, I feel position is really good. It's a good blend of sporty while still being upright and alert to what's going around. Uh, so really happy on that front. And Although there's no front suspension in the urban environment, it's got more than enough flex in the frame and with those tyres that you don't really feel the bumps in any serious way. Um, you know, it's certainly a lot more comfortable than my road bike. Um, things to call out, which are maybe more negative. Uh, like, I mean, this bike's already 12 kilos, which is getting up there for the context. My hardtail aluminium mountain bike with front shocks is 12 kilos. My road bike, which is carbon, full carbon fibre, is at 8, so it's reasonably weighty as far as bikes go, but keep in mind, this is off road with the fenders, with the lights, um, and with the intermediate hub, which means less maintenance, but a little bit more weight. Um, all in all, I think they've got a good package for the weight. Alright, just flipped around to the other side. The only reason I'm doing this is, all the marketing material only shows up on one side, and I'll show you the other view. And one thing to note is the bottom bracket's kind of a bit ugly. Uh, I kind of feel it should have come with like a spacer or something. I did check this is this is how it is intended to look. Um, but yeah, a little bit I don't know, a little bit ugly to me, but you know, 
that was the biggest issue. Other things I'll call out, um, I'm in a little bit of trouble for rubber grommets, they do like to pop out. Um, a little bit of teething, I'm sure I'll get there eventually. Um, I also like to call out that we run it for two months, I have not cleaned it once. And so, the reason I haven't cleaned it for the video is I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how much dirt and grime and you know sweat and other materials ends up on the frame. And honestly, it's pretty good. You can tell there's a little bit of like sweaty commuter um, on it. And certainly I put a little bit of mud down below, a little bit of spray at the back, but all in all the black finish looks pretty respectable, even when it's dirty. Um, no major complaints there. I think it's a really good bike, really happy for purchase. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Kenyan support. Uh, so we had a little bit of drama getting the bike originally. So ordered from Kenyan's website and it shipped as you would expect and then after a few days it seemed to be stuck and then started returning to sender uh, which I thought was pretty weird. So left it for a bit, nothing happened. I emailed the Kenyan support team um, and they were like oh Yes, we didn't do the paperwork correct for New Zealand and UPS returned it. Sorry, uh, we'll resend it. And you know, they resent it and then I eventually got it, but it did require an extra level of messing around that I didn't expect or you know made a great impression on me as a first time customer. I, um, secondly, when it arrived it was quite beat up and I had at least one dent on the front of my fender of my bike. Now, it's not end of the world, but um, I would say they pack their bikes pretty well, but never underestimate the ability of a shipping line to beat something up. Uh, I would say most bikes probably don't have as much fragility as this one because the fenders really make for a package that's hard to properly protect. Uh, but it's something to note that there's a chance that you receive your bike in not perfect condition. And, you know, it might be a bit easier if you're in Europe to say, hey Kenyan, can you pick it back up and replace it? I'm in New Zealand, it's a huge amount of travel to get anything anywhere, shipping's really expensive, um, I'm not going to ship it back for a small dent, but it's just something to be aware of that you might have to live with that. Um, the other problem I had is the problem with the front spokes, so two of the front spokes were weirdly bent when it arrived, and it's not a shipping damage issue, it looks like an actual wheel making issue in a factory, and I was kind of a little bit surprised that he passed for Q&A, um, given sort of how noticeable it was. Anyway, I emailed Kenyon and they were like, oh yep, uh, you should get those replaced, and find your local shop and we'll pay for a replacement, which, you know, actually, that was pretty good service. So, took it to the local bike shop, got the spokes replaced, Kenyon reimbursed me, and this is where it gets kind of amusing because Kenyon's whole business is an online direct shipping company. So I emailed them, hey, I need to replace these spokes. They're like, yep, you're good to go. Please email us a receipt when you do it. A few days later, I get the receipt, email it through, no reply. And they get back this weird email that says, basically, if you've opened a case via email this address, we're not going to read it. But if you have already opened it, then it's okay. But it left me ambiguous as to whether or not they had received my request and whether or not they had actually actioned it. So I left it like a week, nothing had happened. So I opened a new case saying, hey, read this previous case, did you receive it? Are you going to refund? And they were like, oh, yep, yep, all good, we'll sort you out. And then I ended up getting refunded twice. So I don't know what's going on there, Canyon, but you guys have kind of one job, which is be a direct shipper. And your email support system seems like complete garbage. Um, probably outmatched only by your online chat system, which repeatedly told me I was talking to a human, but then would only give me automated responses, um, which was very irritating. And, you know, not to fault the quality of the support I eventually received. All the humans I dealt with at Kenya were very good. All the issues I had, they addressed. Zero issue there. But I was quite surprised at a business that focuses on, uh, uh, fo focuses on direct sales and direct shipping has a support technology system that frankly would be outmatched by a credit card and a Zendesk account. And so I was quite surprised that, yeah, I guess it's just, it feels immature despite the fact that it should be one of the most mature parts of their business. Um, yeah, if, I, if they improve on, you know, that would go a long way to making me more feel more comfortable buying products from them. That said, like I say, they fixed the issues I had, they refunded me twice, so 
I'll take that as an appreciation of the pain I went through interacting with their support four different times. Um, so thank you, Kenyon, for that. Um, but yeah, otherwise, yeah, the business is fine. The only other quirk too, and this is maybe more of an NZ-specific one, is Kenyon is not a New Zealand importer. So although Kenyon collects our GST tax, they don't have an importing code, and so you need to get your own personal importing code to bring it into the country. It doesn't cost you anything, but it requires working with customs to get the code and then giving it to UPS when they phone you. Now, I actually already had one of these codes from a previous large purchase. Um, anything over $1,000 that you import in New Zealand needs to have one of these codes. So when UPS called me, I was able to give them my code, and they immediately unlocked and sent me for the, um, the bike. And just to reiterate, Kenyon did take the GST, and customs recognised that, so there was no tax payable, nothing out of pocket. Uh, but it's a little bit weird one where, like, you'd expect Kenyon, given that they've integrated enough to collect GST, would have done the final step, which is to be an official importer, so there was no paperwork required. You know, I don't have to do paperwork to import a three thousand dollar Apple laptop. Why don't you do paperwork to import a three thousand uh, dollar bike? Um, again, hardly the biggest problem in the world. Just seemed a bit weird. Um, overall, would I recommend this bike? I really like this bike. I would happily recommend it to anyone in a flattish region as a city bike. It is an absolute beast on the flat. It's very fast, very nippy, darts in and out of traffic beautifully well, and that rack on the back means you've got a fair bit of cargo carrying capability. Where I am in New Zealand with our hills, it is a little more taxing, and so for me, I have to work quite hard on the climbs with this bike. I don't mind because I wanted to get a lot more fit, and I'm trying to build up my climbing strength anyway, but it would be a detractor for saying to someone, hey, you're an average rider, this would be a great bike for you in this region. Um, it would need to be geared a little lower, like I say, a 40, maybe a 46 or a 42 on the front, um, just to give it that extra bit of climbing ability, especially when you're tired or when you're carrying cargo. Um, as it stands, it's like, a, it's like being on the second to lowest gear on my road bike. It's still rideable up a hill, but it's just a little bit uncomfortable and you want to sort of switch down and you can't, which is a bit frustrating. Um... But aside from that, you know, it's a really good ride. But yeah, that's my review of the Kenyan Commuter 7. Uh, if you like this review, please give it a thumbs up and shill it to all your friends who also want to buy this bike. Um, but yes, thank you for watching and enjoy riding.